So let's talk about reproductive organs and reproductive structures. Learning goals for today, identify the location and function of male and female reproductive organs, structures, and accessory structures, compare differences between common domesticated species, explain the role of client education regarding reproduction, and explain the benefits and risks of spaying and neutering. Focusing on the male, the areas of interest that we'll discuss in greater detail are the testes, the epididymis, the deferent duct, also called the vas deferens, the urethra, the penis, the prostate gland, which is an accessory gland, and the bulbal urethral gland, which is an accessory gland seen only in the male tomcat. Let's have a look at the testes or testicles. So their function is to produce spermatozoa which is also known as sperm, by the process of spermatogenesis. These sperm fertilize the ova produced by the female. So the sperm fertilize the eggs produced by the female. To produce a little fluid to transport the sperm from the testes into the female tract and to aid in their survival. So that's another function of the testes. And third function is to secrete the hormone testosterone which influences spermatogenesis, the development of male secondary sexual characteristics, and certain male behavioral patterns. So those three functions of the testes would be ideal to get to know. So looking at the testes, they produce sperm and hormones. They're located outside the abdomen in the inguinal region. And the inguinal region, we're talking generally about that region where the hind legs connect to the torso. So right where the hind legs connect to the abdomen, that's generally the area of the inguinal region. And that is roughly where the testicles are, but of course central. They're housed in a protective skin called the scrotum. And you can see here in the picture, so if we walk through what we're looking at here, so we learned about the kidneys and the uh, ureters and the bladder last week. So if we look down, we'll work our way down. So we've got the bladder, we've got the urethra, and then here, caudal and ventral to the penis, just on sort of the the most caudal ventral aspect of the abdomen. We have the testicles and they're housed in a protective skin called the scrotum. And then we'll talk about each component of the testicles and how they work their way up to connect with the urethra. So looking at the testes, if we work our way from inside to outside, we have the seminiferous tubules, the ret testes, the efferent ducts, the epididymis, and the vas deferens. So those structures that have a star beside them, so the seminiferous tubules, the epididymis, and the vas deferens, those are the ones I really want you to get to know and what their purpose is. So looking at the seminiferous tubules, they're on the very inside of the testicles. It's this continuous little convoluted tubule system. And the seminiferous tubules is where spermatogenesis occurs. So that's where sperm are initially developed. And then they make their way to the ret testes, which is this bigger sort of pathway, this bigger network where it's carrying the sperm out toward the efferent ducts and the little efferent ducts work their way into this continuous pathway called the epididymis. The epididymis is a really important structure. We have the head of the epididymis, which would be on the dorsal aspect of the testes. And then we have the body and the tail of the epididymis. So the epididymis works its way all the way down the testicle. And the function of the epididymis and again, getting to know the structure and the function would be ideal for you guys. The function of the epididymis is to allow the store, or sorry, it stores the sperm and it allows the sperm to mature. So for storage and maturation of the sperm. Then we work our way through. So the tail of the epididymis comes up around the other side, outside on the other side of the epididymis, and it turns into the vas deferens, also known as the deferent duct. And the vas deferens, the purpose of the vas deferens are to propel sperm 
into the urethra. So getting to know again the function and the location, so being able to label this testicle in particular with the seminiferous tubules, the epididymis, and the vas deferens, and then knowing their function would be ideal. So we're going to take a closer look at testicles. I like to think of testicles kind of like onions. They have many layers. So there are two layers of peritoneum that surround the testicle. And if you remember that term, peritoneum, that is that membrane that encapsulates the abdominal organs. And that membrane, which we are used to being within the abdominal cavity, has sort of descended and grown with the testicles as they descended out of the peritoneum. So each testicle has two layers of peritoneum that surround and protect the testicle, and each layer is removed when a neuter, aka a castration, is performed. So looking at this image on the right, the top image, so the, the scrotum, the skin that's surrounding the testicle, has been incised, essentially cut through with a scalpel, and now we've expl er, exposed the tunic. And then from there, the scalpel is incising the tunic, so it's removing that outer layer of peritoneum to expose the testicle. And that thin, shiny membrane, you can see the light reflecting off the membrane that's encapsulating the testicle, that is called the tunica albuginea. So we've got the tunica and then the tunica albuginea. But essentially, we refer to these two layers as the tunics, and they surround the testicle. And here's a little bit of a diagram right from your test, or your textbook, sorry. We have the parietal layer of the tunica, and then we have the albuginia layer of the tunica, and then we'll get into a little bit more details about the epididymis. So the spermatic cords are the blood and lymphatic vessels, the nerves, and the vas deferens as well as the pampiniform plexus, which is a meshwork of veins that surrounds the testicular artery. So looking back, if we go back to our picture here, so we've got in this picture, we have the testicle, we have the head of the epididymis, the body of the epididymis, and then the tail of the epididymis is going around the other side. And then here we have this huge, a uh, meshwork of vessels. That's called the pampiniform plexus. It's a massive word. And we have the vas deferens. So those two together we consider as part of the spermatic cords. And within that we also have blood and lymphatic vessels and nerves that bring impulses and exchange blood to the testicles. Here's a close-up as well. So again we've got the testicle, We've got the epididymis, and then working our way up, we have in this sort of mess of vessels here, we have the pampiniform plexus, which is a meshwork of vessels that surrounds the testicular artery, and then the vas deferens within here, which is that tiny little tube that brings the sperm to the urethra. So those together are called the spermatic cords. Looking at our epididymis a little bit closer up, here again is another picture. I use pictures a lot because you have to be able to really understand it visually to understand it when it's happening during a neuter. So again, here is the testicle, oops, right here. And then we've got the epididymis. This is the body of the epididymis, sort of wrapping around the other side is the head of the epididymis, the body, and then it turns into the tail, which then becomes the vas deferens. And then we've got this pampiniform plexus. I just wanted to point out there is a spelling error here. It should be epididymis, um, E-P-I-D-I-D-Y-M-I-S. So just to be aware that is a spelling error. The way I like to think of the epididymis and how it looks, if we go back here, picture it as a chucket. If you've ever played with a border collie or a lab and you have one of these chuckets, that's what I always think the epididymis looks like. It kind of hangs on and nestles the testicle. And just remember, I would ask you in class, what is the epididymis? What is the function of the epididymis? The function is storage and maturation of sperm. So think of the epididymis like a little chucket ball. Okay, carrying on. 
What are the functions of the testes? The functions are to produce sperm, to produce fluid for transport, and male sex hormones. What is the function of the epididymis? The function is to store and mature the sperm. Within the testes, sperm is created in this structure. That is the seminiferous tubules. And what is the function of the vas deferens? That is to propel the sperm into the urethra. All right, spermatozoa. So looking at the sperm themselves, if we look at our image up here, we have the acrosome, which is the top portion. It's this area that protects the head of the sperm. So the acrosome has an enzymatic shield that helps to penetrate the female ova. The head of the sperm, so the acrosome is kind of like a helmet that sits on top of the sperm, kind of like a protective helmet. And then we have the head of the sperm. The head's very important because it contains the genetic information. So that is ideally what the sperm is going to pass on when it connects with the ova. We have the midpiece, which is in through here. And that contains enzymes and many mitochondria to provide energy for movement. And then lastly, we have the tail, which of course is a flagella for movement toward the ova. And I always like to think of sperm as the Homer Simpson sperm, which is down here. So ideally when sperm are moving, they're moving in a nice, smooth, forward motion. They have what's called progressive movement and they have wave motility. And these two types of movement are ideally helping to get the sperm to the ova in order to connect and implant. And it looks like my clip's not going to work. Or will it? There it goes. <laughs> so if we look at Homer Simpson sperm, I have no idea how that Simpson sperm actually got into the ova, but realistically, this one, it should look more like Smithers sperm, which is nice forward, wave motion, wave motility, continuous progressive motion, not like Homer Simpson. Homer Simpson sperm? No. Not going to work. <laughs> Smithers sperm? Perfect. Super important. So, it's humorous, it's fun, but if sperm are not moving correctly, they're not going to make it to the ova, and that animal will not be able to pass on its genetic information. Carrying on down, we have the scrotum. So I mentioned the scrotum previously. It's the sack of skin that protects the testicles. So it houses them, it protects them. Super important, the scrotum actually helps to regulate the temperature of the testes. They have a couple different muscles, the cremaster and the dartos muscle, that pass down through the inguinal ring, which is the slight opening in the abdominal cavity where the testicles have descended through. And these muscles attach to the scrotum. Actually, I'll just go back. So looking at the thermoregulation of the testes, in order for testicles to produce an ideal amount of sperm, they have to remain slightly cooler than body temperature. So when it's super hot outside, the cremaster muscle and the dartos muscle will actually relax and allow the testicles to hang further away from the body so that they can maintain themselves at slightly cooler than body temperature. Likewise, when it's very cold out, those little muscles pull the testicles and the scrotum back up toward the body to keep them warm. So interesting little evolutionary aspects that help with thermoregulation of the testes. So how the testes are developed, um, essentially, so the testicles start in the abdominal cavity when an animal is in utero when they're a fetus and quite often when they're brand new when they're just born their testicles are up in their abdominal cavity and then over time 
their testicles descend. So in order to create this descent of the testes, they have this little piece of connective tissue called the gubernaculum and it attaches the testes to the scrotum. So they have the gubernaculum, which is the best word ever, gubernaculum, and it attaches the testes to the base of the scrotum. As the animal grows and as their scrotum develops, the testes are gradually pulled caudally and ventrally through the inguinal rings, which are openings in the abdominal muscles where they descend through. So over time, because that gubernaculum has secured them to the scrotum, over time, as the scrotum matures and grows, it starts to pull those testicles down with it. If only one testicle is descended, so if an animal only has one testicle that's visible on the outside of their body, then they are referred to as mon orchid. And if they have no testicles that are descended, and both of these testicles are still in their abdominal cavity, then they are referred to as crypt orchid. Now the tricky part with this, if they're crypt orchid or mon, or mon orchid at the time of neutering, we have to let the clients know that this now becomes a more invasive surgery, so slightly more invasive, because all of a sudden the doctor has to go into the abdominal cavity rather than just going in through the scrotum. So they have to go into the, the abdominal cavity and look around for those missing testicles. Likewise, it can become a little bit more expensive for the owner because the time involved is longer. So it's a little bit more of an involved surgery if the animal is crypt orchid or mon orchid. And best practice is for the vet to find the missing testicles through the abdominal cavity using an ultrasound prior to going in surgically, just to make sure that they are there. Testicles, when should they be in the scrotum? It should be between 10 to 12 weeks in the feline and around 12 weeks in the canine. So, you know, if the animal is 12 weeks old and they haven't descended quite yet, remember that every animal is different, bring them back in a couple of weeks, have the doctor feel, and go from there. So the descent of the testes, the way that some <laughs> documents refer to the gubernaculum, is as essentially a Boy Scout leader, <laughs> which I don't know why I find very funny. So this great descent of the testes is all about the gubernaculum attaching to the testes and the scrotum and then leading the way out of the body. All right, carrying on down the line to the penis, the functions of the penis are to convey sperm and fluids from the testes into the female reproductive tract during mating, to convey urine from the bladder to the outside via the urethra. The canine penis is caudal ventral from the velvet pelvis to ventral abdomen. And the feline, as we discussed last time, is very short and it's located ventral to the anus. The prepuce is the sheath of skin that encloses the penis when it's not erect. The inner portion is smooth and it's made up of moist mucous membranes. So here's that picture again that we looked at a little bit last week or a similar one last week. So we've got in the canine, you can see here we have the bladder and then we've got the prostate gland and then it's working its way down. We get the penis extending through here from essentially the start of the um or the end of the bladder sorry from <laughs> the caudal aspect of the pelvis essentially is where the penis starts and works its way down and through with the urethra being in the middle of the penis and then of course it's connecting with the testicles via the urethra to deposit those fluids and sperm and then very similar with the cat, except that instead of the penis being this long backward C shape, the penis is very short. And of course we know that it has like a little Christmas tree shape and it's located on the caudal aspect of the animal's body and it is ventral to the testicles and the anus. So here we talked about this a little bit last week as well. 
If we look at the picture on the left, that is a penis of a cat that is intact. So a penis of a cat who has reached sexual maturity. And of course they have their testicles still. So those little barbs on the penis are made of keratinized epithelial tissue. So that kind of waterproof, well-protected epithelial tissue. And the purpose of those barbs, they figure, is for mating. So what ends up happening is when the male cat copulates or mates with the female cat, the barbs create a local inflammation and irritating or irritation in the female reproductive tract. So what that does, because it causes inflammation, once the cat has deposited its sperm sample in the female, then a local inflammation occurs and her, her vaginal canal becomes quite swollen and essentially traps the sperm inside. That's their theory about why this happens. So hence, they have the barbs on their penis. Now, when you neuter a cat, the barbs on the penis will go away. Those are directly based on the level of testosterone that's in the cat's system. And of course, when we neuter a cat, we're taking away the testicles. So we're taking away their ability to produce tes testosterone. Picture in the middle. I just want to show you what a male cat looks like from the back. So this is a neutered cat. So we've got the anus as pointed here. And then this is where their testicles would be. But this cat was neutered quite some time ago. And then here we have the prepuce. And then underneath that prepuce is the penis which is a little dot when it's within the prepuce. Over here, you can see that the person has extrapolated the penis, so extruded the penis from the prepu prepuce, and you can see here the penis is starting to come out. I'm just going to point out this person should be wearing gloves. So another thing too, um, cats are induced ovulators. So unlike dogs and unlike humans, Dogs have a routine schedule for when they go into heat. So dogs go into heat about two times a year. Cats go into heat when they are stimulated to do so. And the stimulation is a physical stimulation. So when their vaginal canal is physically stimulated, that will cause the cat to ovulate. So they, they'll probably already be in heat and the cat will be all rangy, yelling, meowing around the house. And then when they're stimulated physically, so when their vaginal canal is stimulated by a penis or otherwise, then they'll actually induce ovulation. So dogs, their ovulation occurs naturally based on their hormone cycle. Cats, it's induced physically by physical stimulation of their vaginal canal. So that being said, if you have a cat who's in heat, sometimes clients will bring their cats into heat, or sorry, no, sometimes uh, clients will bring their in heat cats to the clinic for spaying and we can't spay them in heat because their um, uterus is engorged with blood and it's much more fragile so it's a much more riskier surgery. So quite often what the vet will do is literally stimulate the female cat's vagina with a q-tip and that will send them into ovulation which ends the heat. Interesting little trick. So in the cat, the testicles should be descended by 10 to 12 weeks. What is the gubernaculum? It is a band of connective tissue that attaches the testicles to the scrotum, and it's kind of like the scout leader. What is the function of the acrosome in sperm? It's to protect the head of the sperm and to release enzymes to help penetrate the ova. What is the purpose of the barbs on the tomcat's penis? And tomcat, just so you know, is the term given to male cats who are still intact, so they still have both of their testicles. And the purpose is to cause inflammation after copulation in the female. <clears throat> and what is the function of the cremaster and the dartos muscles? It can move the testes closer to or further away from the body to aid in thermal regulation of the testicles. So now we will move on to discuss accessory glands. So here it's hard to tell, but this is a cute little prostate gland. 
So accessory gland functions. The function of the accessory glands is generally to secrete seminal fluids, which increase the volume of the ejaculate to aid the passage of sperm into the female tract. It's to provide the correct environment for sperm survival and to neutralize the acidity of the urine within the urethra. The glands that we'll talk about, the accessory glands, are the prostate gland and the bulbal urethral gland. The prostate gland, if we look here in this picture, it's right up here, it's very close to the neck of the bladder, and it hugs or surrounds the base of the urethra. It has its multiple ducts carry secretions into the urethra, and it's present in dogs and cats and bulls and stallions and in people as we know as well. It's a very popular gland. The problem with prostates is as the animal ages, if the dog or cat is not neutered, over time as they age, they can get enlarged prostates, just like with people. And the problem with an enlarged prostate we know a couple of things. So the prostate itself, it hugs the urethra. So as it gets larger over time, it can actually constrict the urethra. And that's why with humans, people who have enlarged prostates can only pee a little bit at a time. Same with dogs. If they have a really enlarged prostate, they may only be able to urinate small amounts at a time because the prostate is compressing their urethra. Likewise, because of the physical size in their abdominal cavity, I'll just go back to this picture here. So here we have a colon, and remember the black on an x-ray means that it's filled with some sort of gas. So this is air, or gas, it is gas technically. So look at the thickness of the colon, that's normal thick colon, and then look here how it suddenly becomes super, super, super thin. So that is indicative of a um, enlarged prostate. So the prostate itself would be within here, and you can see that the tumor on the prostate or the enlargement of the prostate is compressing on the colon, causing it to be very, very thin. So here's a good picture. So you've got colon, a lot of gas in the colon, and then the prostate, the enlarged prostate is compressing and causing the colon to get quite small. So that can be very difficult for an animal when they have to have a bowel movement. If they have an enlarged prostate and it's compressing their colon, they might have to, well, they might have to strain to defecate. They might have some challenges with defecation. Moving on, the bulbal urethral gland is a gland located right here. Tiny, tiny, tiny little gland. And it's not present in dogs, it's only present in cats. And it's ducts that enter the urethra near the caudal border of the pelvis. And its function is to secrete mucinous fluid just before ejaculation that clears and lubricates the urethra. So again, it's a tiny little gland and it kind of just clears the way, clears the urethra out to ensure that it's clear for the ejaculate to make its way through the urethra and ideally into the female reproductive system. Again, not present in dogs, just present in cats. This picture here, so if you can see what this image is all about, this is a puppy, and you can see that this is the prepuce. So this is the prepuce, the penis is inside the prepuce. We have the two testicles down here. This is its back left leg, its back right leg, and then we have these two swellings on their penis. So this is really common to see if you give a male dog, especially a male intact dog, a belly rub. And these are called bulbous glandus. And it's also called the bulb of the gland's penis. So it is not a gland. If we go back here, it's an enlargement and technically it's erectile tissue. So this will start to happen if you're giving your puppy a belly rub. Essentially, you're stimulating them and you're getting them very excited. The purpose of the bulbous glandus is to be enlarged during and after copulation to allow for this tying effect between male and female animals. 
and typically it's male and female dogs that it's most prominent in. So these two dogs, the male and the female, are tied together. So after copulation, what ends up happening? The male dog ejaculates, and it of course goes into the female reproductive tract. And then at this point, their bulbous glandus is swelling. So the bulbous glandus swells so much that essentially it acts like a cork and it becomes stuck. It causes the penis to get stuck in the female reproductive tract. Again, the goal, so they suspect evolutionary wise, the goal is to keep the penis in the female reproductive tract as long as possible to ensure the best chances of success that the ejaculation has made it and the sperm have made it into the female ova. So if you see two dogs that are stuck together and they're a male and female, it means that they have copulated, so they've made it and now the bulbous glandus is swollen and they are stuck. This should go away. It can take up to a half an hour. Do not try to pull the two dogs apart. I repeat, do not try to pull the two dogs apart. And when clients call you and ask what they should do, tell them just to leave the dogs alone. Do not pull the dogs apart. It would be very, very painful. Review, which accessory glands are found in the intact male dog? The answer is the prostate gland. What is the bulbous glandus? It's erectile tissue on either side of the penis and essentially it's for the tie. So it's to tie the two dogs together. What are the symptoms of an enlarged prostate? They could have difficult urination and compression of the colon. So quite often challenges with urination, challenges with defecation. And what should one do if they see two dogs that are tied together after copulation? They should leave them alone and wait. It normally takes about a half an hour. All right, let's move on to the female reproductive tract. The female dog is known as a bitch and the female cat is known as a queen. And the parts of interest of the female reproductive system are the ovaries, the uterine, or uterine, the uterine tube, also known as the oviduct, the uterus, which includes the uterine horns and the body, the cervix, the vagina, the vestibule, and the vulva. Dogs and cats and most mammals are known as bicornate, which means, or cornuate, which means that they have two distinct horns to their uterus, which means, unlike humans, we have one big body of the uterus. These guys, because they're bicornuate, it means that they can develop puppies or kittens in both sides of their uterus. So we can get puppies and kittens developing on the left within the left horn of the uterus and the right horn of the uterus. Likewise, these guys are also known as multiparous, which means that they have more than one offspring. So the female reproductive system functions are to produce female sex hormones, the development of reproductive cells. They provide a site for fertilization, provides an environment for embryo to develop, carries the embryo or fetus for the entire gestation period, and provides a passage from the uterus to the outside world. So the female reproductive system does a whole lot. And this is how it's set up in the body. If we have a look here, um, what you're seeing here, of course, are the, uh, the aorta and then the vena cava, the kidneys, the branches, the left adrenal gland, etc. And then what we're looking at here, we've got the ureters, and then we have the round ligaments of the uterus. So these are the, the ligaments that attach the uterus essentially to the body wall. We have the ovarian arteries and veins, which of course supply and transfer blood to the, um, to the ovaries as well as to the uterus itself. 
And then we have, uh, where are we at here? The suspensory ligament of the ovary, which is this tiny little ligament, which is so important. And it holds the ovary and the uterus suspended toward the cranial aspect of the abdomen. And then of course, the left and, or the right and the left uterine horn, and then the uterine body through here. So that's the way it sits within the body. The Essentially, the bladder would be here, but it's kind of tilted forward, so the bladder would be here. And, of course, there's a bunch of intestines as well, which they've taken down for the sake of showing you. So looking at the ovaries, they are located in the dorsal abdomen near the kidneys. So essentially, looking here, they are located in the cranial dorsal abdomen, so they are held right up close to those lumbar muscles, just like the kidneys. But the difference is the ovaries are within the peritoneal cavity, whereas the kidneys are considered to be retroperitoneal. There's definitely species variation in their appearance. So depending if it's a dog or a cat or a cow or a horse, the function of course is to produce ova or eggs and that, um, that process is called oogenesis and those eggs would be ready for fertilization by the sperm of the male and their other function is to act as an endocrine gland secreting the hormones estrogen and progesterone so looking at this image here what you're seeing you're seeing this is the uterus so this is the right horn and the left horn of the uterus this would be the body of the uterus which is mostly taken away this is a whole lot of fat as well as broad ligament which is attaching the uterus to the body wall and then here deeply embedded in this little capsule of fat and suspensory ligament is the ovary so it's deeply deeply embedded in fat for protection and thermal regulation as well as suspensory ligaments which keep them held up in the cranial abdomen here's an image of the i just wanted to point out the ligaments in this case this of course is a human uterus so animals are bicornuate so they look a bit different but looking at this here the broad ligament of the uterus, just important to note that it, it surrounds the entire outside of the uterus and connects to the ovaries as well, and it keeps the uterus attached to the body wall. And likewise here, this is showing you again the ovary and the suspensory ligament right here, which connects the ovary to the cranial aspect of the abdominal cavity. So the ligaments are so important because of course they're going to keep the ovary suspended cranially and dorsally in the abdomen and really, really important overall that broad or round ligament of the uterus itself, super important that it keeps it attached to the body wall, most important when the animal has fetuses developing within the uterus. So it prevents the uterus from prolapsing and falling during pregnancy. The suspensory ligament of the ovary, oh, of the ovary, of the ovary is attached to the body wall in the area of the last rib. So that's how cranial it is. And it has a small amount of muscle present to flex with the weight of the developing fetuses. It suspends the ovaries, the oviducts, and the uterus, and it contains blood vessels and nerves. So really important when the doctor is performing an ovario hysterectomy. So that is typically what we refer to as a spay procedure on a dog or a cat. They are removing the ovaries and the entire uterus of the animal. So what they do is they clamp just cranial to the ovary, they clamp that suspensory ligament and they ligate it, they tie it off with suture material. And they have to be very, very, very careful that they suture it properly because if they don't suture it properly, that suspensory ligament has a ton of blood vessels present within it. And if they let that suspensory ligament go without tying it off, then the animal can bleed to death. It's very, very scary, and that's called a dropped pedicle. And that is a surgical emergency. So we talked about the suspensory ligament. Now we're going to move on 
just past the ovaries to the oviducts, which I believe your textbook refers to as the uterine tubes. The oviducts are the tiny little tubes that connect the ovaries to the uterus. The purpose is to collect the eggs or the ova as they're released from the graphene follicles. And essentially that's when they're released from the ovaries. And they convey those eggs from the ovaries to the uterine horns. They provide the correct environment for the survival of both the ova and the sperm. And it is within the oviducts that the ova is fertilized. So if you're asked, where is the egg fertilized? It's within the oviduct. The infundibulum are enlarged openings at the ovarian end of each oviduct. It's kind of like a funnel and they have little ciliated cells on them. And of course, the purpose of the ciliated cells in the infundibulum is to grab and grasp at the ova or the eggs and bring them down further into the oviducts. And the muscle contractions and cilia movement guide those little ova toward the uterus. So again, the oviduct is the typical site of fertilization of the egg. The uterus is a Y shape in the dog and cat, so it's bicornuate. And the function is to provide a receptacle in which the embryos can develop into full term fetuses. Another function is to provide the correct environment for the survival of those embryos and to provide the means whereby the developing embryos can receive nutrients from the dam. This is made possible by the placenta and the dam is just referring to the mother. So whether that is the dog or the cat. So you can see here that this in itself, these are the horns of the uterus. So the uterus has a right and a left horn and then a uterine body. The uterine wall has different layers. It has the endometrium, which is the lining, the in, inside lining, and it's the lining composed of simple columnar epithelial and simple tubular glands. This, the purpose of the endometrium is to secrete mucus and other substances, and this lining thickens during pregnancy, so it's the innermost lining. Then we have the myometrium, and we know that myo typically refers to muscle. This is the thick layer of smooth muscle, and it produces strong contractions during parturition. Parturition is another term for birth. And then the mesometrium, or broad ligament, is a fold of the visceral peritoneum, so that peritoneal membrane, that suspends the uterus from the dorsal body wall. So this here is the mesometrium, also known as the broad ligament, and it suspends that uterus to the dorsal body wall. So we have the innermost layer is the endometrium, that thick muscle layer is the myometrium, and then that broad ligament, which is an extension of the peritoneum, is the mesometrium. The cervix is a smooth muscle sphincter between the body of the uterus and the vagina, and it controls access to the inside or the lumen of the uterus from the vagina. Normally, so most of the animal's life, it's tightly closed, except during estrus, so that's essentially in their heat cycle, and parturition. So why it would be open during estrus, that's when an animal is ready to ovulate. So it's at that point that their cervix opens to allow any semen sample that has come into the vagina. It allows the semen to get into the uterus and work its way up to the oviduct. And likewise, during parturition, which is also known as birth, then of course the cervix opens to allow the fetus to come out. And then we have the vagina, the vestibule, and the vulva. The vagina and the vestibule are, is a muscular tube that extends caudally from the cervix and connects it with the vulva. And the vulva is composed of the vestibule, the clitoris, and the labia. And the, re, the yeah, I can't speak. The urethra opens on the floor of the vestibule, so the ventral aspect. And the vulva 
enlargement is common when an animal is in heat. So if we look at this dog here on the right, this dog is either in heat or she's an older intact female dog, which means that she's not spayed. So that's a secondary sex characteristic that develops with hormonal development. Their vulva will get larger. And some dogs even need a vulvoplasty because their vulva is so large that it essentially starts to collect bacteria, which can cause t uh, bladder infections. But also the vulva naturally enlarges during their heat cycles. So carrying on with the female reproductive tract and associated glands, we have mammary glands. And we talked a little bit about mammary glands when we talked about epithelial tissue and specific special glands. So mammary glands are modified cutaneous glands and the bitch, so the female dog, has five pairs of mammary glands. The queen, or the female cat, has four pairs of mammary glands, of course, to supply milk to their young. Mastitis, that term is important to know, it's inflammation or infection of the mammary glands. And the mammary glands themselves get very red, they get very, very enlarged and very firm, and they're also warm to the touch, and it's extremely painful for the dog and cat. Looking at estrus cycle intervals, so estrus cycles is their, um, we call it menstrual cycle, it's a little bit different for humans, but essentially it's referring to the same thing. It's this continuous cycling of hormones and of course, sexual development. So animals that are polyesterous, that's a term given to animals that cycle continuously throughout the year if they are not pregnant. Examples of animals that fit into that category are cattle and swine, so cows and pigs. Seasonally polyesterous are animals with seasonal variations in estrus cycles. Examples are horses, sheep, and cats. Diesterous are animals with two cycles per year, usually in the spring and the fall. And the example there are dogs. And then monoesterous are animals that roughly have one cycle per year, which, you know, who needs to know it? Who knows? But a fox and a mink are examples of that. Okay, so we looked at the reproductive tracts, the reproductive structures and their functions. We looked at a bit of the physiology as well as the anatomy. So really important, we need to know why do we recommend spaying and neutering? So why do we neuter? Neuter is typically referred to, or it's referring to the practice of removing the testicles from a male intact dog. So why we neuter, it minimizes roaming behavior. So it minimizes that behavior where they're looking for a mate. It can minimize certain aggressive behavior. It prevents male dogs from impregnating female dogs, which is the biggest reason right now because our overpopulation is massive. In our country, in Canada, shelters are inundated with cats and kittens and every single spring they get hundreds of kittens dumped at the shelter and nobody likes to euthanize kittens we don't like that happening it's an awful thing however if there are too many kittens out there in the world then they're going to get very very sick so if there's not enough resources for those kittens they start to spread viruses to each other and unfortunately it's because of this that we end up seeing euthanasias not necessarily because the numbers are too high. A lot of shelters definitely don't kill just because of population, but these cats get sick. So number one reason it prevents dogs and cats from impregnating females. It can prevent many prostate problems. It reduces or eliminates the risk of spraying and marking behavior. So male cats, when they're not neutered, they will spray in the house, which is a marking behavior. And that means that they are lifting up their tails and spraying a really stinky urine on a vertical surface. Same with dogs lifting their legs. And it's going to reduce the number of unwanted cats, kittens, puppies, or dogs. 
Why do we want to spay? So spaying typically refers to an ovariohysterectomy, which is removing the uterus and the ovaries from the female dog and cat. However, you also can do an ov uh, ovariectomy, which is where you remove just the ovaries from the female dog or cat. That's a whole other story. Um, there's definitely good points to that as well. Overall, why we spay, in general, if you're going to do one or the other, then there's definite health benefits that are more aligned with spaying female dogs. The male dogs and cats as well, the males, we mostly neuter them to prevent prostate problems. That's their biggest health issue, but most of it is behavioral based and reduction in population. Females definitely have health risks that are associated with heat cycles. So in general, the body conserves more energy by eliminating their heat cycle. If you're ever in an area where there's a lot of stray dogs, you'll notice that the females are almost always super skinny. This is in part because they, of course, have to fight for food. But also, they need more energy when they're undergoing regular heat cycles, and they often can't get it. There's less desire to roam and search for a mate and their risk of mammary gland tumors, ovarian and uterine cancer is reduced or eliminated, especially if the spay is done before their first heat cycle. So there's sort of an old myth, or as they used to call them an old wives tale, that you should always let female dogs and cats go through their first heat cycle or have a litter of puppies or kittens before you spay them. This is totally, totally false information. The longer they have heat cycles for, the more often they have heat cycles, the higher chances they will have of developing mammary gland tumors. And mammary gland cancer is not easily treatable in the cat. The dog, it's not very nice. It is treatable. It's quite painful. It's quite awful. But the cat, it's almost always a euthanasia. So keep that in mind. Please do not let them go into a heat if you're planning on spaying them. It, of course, reduces the number of unwanted cats, kittens, dogs, and puppies, and it eliminates the risk of a pyometra. So a pyometra is this fun thing, not so fun thing, that happens to female cats and dogs and animals in general, whereby their uterus gets infected and starts to develop pus. So their uterus becomes massively swollen with pus and their body becomes a walking infection. Why this happens, if we think about their heat cycle, we know that during estrus, their cervix is open. So there's potential that bacteria could get into their uterus because their gatekeeper, their cervix has opened. Also during estrus, they have discharge. So they either have bloody discharge or they have like a mucoid discharge. And of course, warm, moist environments attract bacteria. So as long as the cervix is open and they have a bit of discharge, there's a good chance that they could get a pyometra. So looking at the uterus on the left is this dog. I think it was dogs. Yes, it's a dog, Holly. This is her uterus. It's filled with pus. That's why it's so thick and looks like two big sausages. Whereas over on the right, we have a mature uterus that is not filled with pus. And you can see here are the ovaries and this thin little muscular uterus. Okay, thin little pink uterus. And then of course the broad ligaments off on the sides. So Holly's uterus is thick and filled with pus and it gets bigger. So cats and dogs, very common for them to get this. You can see how gigantic, how thick this uterus is, and this is completely filled with pus. So the veterinarian is doing an emergency surgery whereby they have to remove the uterus and the ovaries and get rid of the pus in the body. It's horrible. So that's a good reason to spay and neuter your pets. Review, what does it mean when a uterus is <coughs> bicorneate? It has two horns. <clears throat> what is the function of ciliated cells in the lining of the oviducts? It's to convey the ova toward the uterus. Within which area of the uterus will the embryo implant and develop? 
that is within the uterine horns. Oh, that is so weird that I have that <laughs> answer. Clearly, I was using this format from a different PowerPoint. So the answer there, where the embryo will implant and develop, it's within the uterine horns. And within which structure is the ova fertilized by the sperm? That is within the oviducts. And this structure is a fold of the visceral peritoneum that suspends the uterus from the dorsal body wall. That is the broad ligament or mesometrium. When is the cervix open? That's during estrus and parturition. Inflammation or infection of the mammary glands is called mastitis. The term given to animals who have two estrus cycles per year, they are called diestrus. And the term given to animals who have more than one estrus cycles per year, typically changing with the season, they're called seasonally polyesterous. And that is the end.